mostly I wanted to give a sense of um, where we've come from. We, we started in uh, July of 2011 and at a time when uh, research services in, uh, was still a new field for, um, for libraries and we were fortunate to be able to um, start large with uh, more than one staff person. Um, the impetus was around the NSF data management plan requirements, um, but we were also going to be the uh, uh, initial, um, one of the initial sites for a data archive that was being built by um, the Data Conservancy Project that was headed at JHU. Um, since then, we have uh, at least matured to adolescence, I think, uh, as, as a new li uh, area of uh, library science. Um, uh, especially around figuring out how to do uh, data archiving as a service. So um, I'll get into a bit of that. Um, as a preview, I'll go over what we do now. Um, we provide uh, consulting assistance with data, um, data management plan preparation, uh, but also general data management consulting with researchers. Um, we have a, a number of uh, data management training uh, one-hour sessions. Um, that we're doing in a variety of data management topics. And then, as I mentioned, we also operate the JHU Data Archive. Uh, so just a little bit more on our, our origins. Um, we, uh, uh, around 2011, um, JHU had uh, received um, a uh, large grant from NSF's uh, um, d uh, data infrastructure um, projects uh, called uh, Data Conservancy, uh, led by Saeed Chowdhury. They were building um, an archive plus trying to get a better understanding of support services around our data archiving. Um, around the, this, this started in 2009, around uh, 2011 when NSF had its uh, DMP requirement um, the uh, researchers started coming to the library looking for help. So it seemed like a good time to start a new service that would provide this help and also um, be able to uh, run, run the archive. Um, they did so in collaboration with our entrepreneurial library program, which is a special unit of our library that um, works with uh, launching new services and also can do uh, financial transfers. Um, so it was a good partnership. Um, our, our department, I mentioned briefly, our department's unusual in its funding. It's actually not funded by the library. It's, it's funded directly by um, several of the schools at JHU. Um, so it's, uh, and they provide funding for the archiving service. Um, and then they also asked us to not have free data archiving, but to um, have a fee for the researcher. So that's, uh, a little bit of a different structure than some schools are, are uh, doing, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Very briefly in putting this in the context of where we were, we, we, we thought that, you know, having gone to conferences like these, that we were pretty lucky to have uh, uh, more than one person. Did I mention? Okay. Oh, that's odd. Uh, Okay, I didn't mention our, oh, there it is, our staffing. Yes, I knew I forgot something. <laughs> yes, that we, we, we were unusual in having more than one person doing this job. So, so we, we started out with two data management consultants and, and hired a third about a year later. We're hiring a fourth this, this July, so that's, that's special. And we're, we're sharing a part-time data curation specialist with a, another department. Till recently, we had a systems administrator and a, an archive developer. Um, who helped us set up our archive, and they've now moved on to other projects. Okay, getting back to where we were. In uh, 20, 2013, uh, we, we wanted to see where, how our services fit with what else was going around in the country, so we collaborated with the University of uh, Virginia to do a, an ARL spec survey and looked at, um, did a survey of 73 ARL uh, libraries, they, uh, or at least we got 73 responses, and found that um, by 2013, uh, research data services were well established, but um, data management services were growing. 68% um, uh, had something going, and, and most of the rest were planning on something. Um, a lot of the staffs were kind of part-time amongst, amongst uh, departments. Uh, a number were doing single-person 
people at the job or uh, just a few had uh, devoted departments like we did. Um, and focusing on archiving, um, uh, a number were venturing into adding, uh, doing some uh, data archiving, mostly by, um, through their existing inf institutional repositories and allowing uh, attachment of data files. Just five were doing, um, hosting their own research archives. I think uh, Purdue was one of them. Um, and then uh, most of the funding was coming from internal budgets. Um, just a few were actually charging back to the researcher. So that puts some perspective of where we are, and I think um, there's certainly been some changes in the number. I saw the recent survey uh, that was done, so I think um, it's still slow but steady uh, uh, progress. Um, I'm going to go over briefly um, our data management consultation process because uh, this is where uh, in addition to being where our services started, it's also the way that we initially kind of generated some interest in business around having people actually archive data with us. Um, uh, from the start, we uh, decided to do uh, in-office consultations with researchers, um, not just providing uh, templates or a website, um, but actually have a chance to have a conversation with researchers, be able to um, customize their efforts of writing those uh, data management plans around the, the uh, research that they're doing, um, and also have a discussion where we could um, evaluate if they were planning on sharing data, what might their options be? Um, we wouldn't say just use our archive. We would first see what, what's out there for your field that would be appropriate. And for the many fields that really don't have uh, uh, repositories for their field, we, um, we would discuss the uh, JHU data archive as a possibility. And uh, doing it at the proposal stage would allow them to, to add archiving into their budget. Um, the other part of the process, we would, uh, once they wrote a draft of their plan, we would uh, give them feedback. Um, and that, that worked well. Um, we we uh, also developed um, a few uh, tools which are available on our website. Um, we uh, developed a, a questionnaire for um, both conducting the, uh, the meetings, the consultation meetings with researchers developing the plan, and also a takeaway one where they could answer the questions on this questionnaire and, and essentially draft their two pages. Um, and uh, another thing we developed was this uh, uh, reviewer's guide. This, this is for uh, the faculty members who had to sit on uh, uh, grant reviews and read these uh, data management plans, they really didn't have much guidance for what to do about these. So we developed an easy uh, checklist so that they could sort of check off what components were there. Unfortunately, almost no one used this thing, so it was <laughs> we didn't garner a whole lot of interest, but we used it ourselves for nice field, uh, field checks and going over, giving feedback on, on, um, on uh, data management plans. So that's also on our, our website. So, um, as many of you who have been uh, doing any data management plan support may also have experienced, um, initially this service started out strong in uh, 2011, 2012. We had um, uh, over 100 consultations, um, and then it started to trickle down um, to, to just a few a month. Um, I think some of you know some of the factors involved. We, we got plenty of messages that, that they felt, you know, the, the reviewers really weren't looking at them. They would just check them off whether they were there or not. A lot of people copied their own data management plans or others. Um, and uh, I think most people just sort of figured it out on, on their own. Um, and we, we are able to see data management plans um, and the quality varies widely. Um, so. It would be nice to do a little more direct consultation, uh, but we, what we did find is um, that we, we, we are able to provide a lot of help with especially some of the, um, the new funders who are coming online uh, for uh, data management plan requirements. Um, we were looking at uh, how um, these new uh, open access requirements will give a boost to uh, NIH. I think. Johns Hopkins may still be the biggest receiver of NIH grants, so when that does kick in, we'll be plenty busy. Um, but we also are having um, quite a few uh, consultations um, on 
outside of the proposal process and, and uh, getting more uh, occasion to um, find other ways to uh, get more broadly into the depth of how to uh, better manage data during the research process. And um, if we, so we, if we look at our services right now along the familiar uh, research data life cycle, um, we're, we're covering sort of the front end of the um, proposal stage for data management planning and also at the end of project looking at how to preserve and share data online. But we're also trying to uh, build expertise in way of, ways of uh, talking with researchers on what we call sort of the operational or, uh, phase of research, actually doing the research and, and looking at ways to cover what kind of um, uh, support and tips and, and uh, um, other ideas we can share around topics like data organization, storage backup, uh, metadata, documentation, the kind of things that are actually on the data management plan. Um, and, and, and mostly with not just, not a focus on how you're doing your research that varies so much, but the common denominator is um, how are you preparing your data for sharing or for preservation? Um, those, those are areas where researchers tend not to have really thought through. And, and now, as even publishers all of a sudden are saying, oh, and you need to share your data with your publication, people are coming to us and saying, uh, how do I do this? So, um, so that's been a, a good way to, to build off of just the simple uh, data management plan support. Um, another thing we try to do is uh, work our way into the context of all the other services that are related to research support. Um, at Johns Hopkins, it's a very diffuse uh, environment where um, there are lots of little uh, subservices and things that uh, researchers really don't necessarily know how to navigate through. So uh, we try to be kind of provide sort of a concierge service where, where we're able to field uh, questions and be able to know, okay, when, when do you need to talk to IRB? What can our other uh, subject librarians support with? Um, uh, know what central IT is doing, what services they offer, um, and, and uh, even some of these many little uh, centers and institutes that spring up and will have like um, biostatistics experts. Um, and uh, it's not just our department, but the school in general is trying to um, build a little more a knowledge base and integration of, of uh, support services and try to unify them a bit more. So that's our consulting. I'm. Um, these slides kind of went a strange way. Um, I will um, not get into too much into our training workshops unless there's time at questions at the end. Um, this is something that was, uh, at first, it wasn't really in our, our original plan for services to have training, but we experimented with doing a one-hour uh, talk on um, uh, preparing data management plans. And where it wasn't hugely uh, popular, it did give us a different audience, especially graduate students. So we, we thought we would uh, continue from there and um, develop some, some more talks. Right now we have uh, uh, four one-hour session topics, and it is arguably our most successful service. If we've had um, you know, 942 per, uh, participants, uh, mostly in the last two years. Um, and, uh, we're finding uh, new ways to come up with new topics and, and do some good outreach to people. I'll just um, kind of read off the topics at this point. The fir first is um, preparing uh, data management plans. Uh, many of you are, are uh, trying uh, this approach for uh, planning. We did uh, one on um, data management, sharing best practice topics. Um, this is where we built some uh, tips and guidelines and um, uh, talk around uh, some of the uh, elements that are commonly on the data management plans, like uh, data organization, file naming, version control, uh, encryption software, backup software, and, and introduce the idea of documentation and metadata. This, this course was uh, then uh, recently integrated with um, uh, JHU's Responsible Conduct of Research Training, which is mandatory for uh, graduate students at um, at uh, two of our, uh, three of our schools. So that's, that's been a good way to uh, get more integrated into, um, into the uh, coursework of other uh, schools. Um, this is a new one I'll mention briefly. Uh, we found a need to um, 
look more at the, the process of when it comes time to share data. Um, so, so much research has uh, human, human subject identifiers and there's really not much training. We went to the IRBs and they really didn't have much to say about, well, what about the data sharing stage? What, what's, what resources are there to support research? So um, researchers. So we uh, decided to do a training on that. Um, we, uh, I worked with our um, social science data librarian and we both went to um, ICPSR's uh, wor summer workshops on disclosure analysis and then adapted that three-day course into a one-hour talk. And uh, that's been um, uh, a very uh, successful uh, training. Um, we've had as much over 60 people in a, in a workshop, which is like filling a stadium in library world. So, <laughs> so that's, that's been uh, uh, an interesting one. Um, and then quickly we do one on uh, goals of um, some, some hints for how to work with data that's being shared in spreadsheets. Uh, and then uh, we're coming up with a new one uh, focused on um, preparing data for um, preservation or sharing at the end of a project. Um, okay, and we can go into more details if there's time and questions, but I want to move on to our, our archiving services. So um, as I mentioned, uh, we were initially set up to be uh, one of the sites that would be using the Data Conservancy um, software, which was to provide um, online access to, to data and also a preservation system un underneath that would uh, be up to a good data digital curation standards. Um, so around the time our service started in 2011, uh, NSF cut back their uh, data infrastructure funding, uh, and uh, Jeju was one of, one of the victims. So their, their funding got kind of cut in half. So all of a sudden their development time on their software slowed to a crawl, and, and, and actually um, since then uh, they have now rescoped a bit to mostly focus on um, the preservation infrastructure that would underlie uh, uh, I, I eventually a number of different platforms um, and be able to talk to each other through APIs. Um, but for us, um, our model was to, um, especially during our uh, data management plan consultations, we were getting uh, a, a quite a number of researchers who had, who agreed to have archiving services with us and then after a year or so had data ready to be archived. So we had to scramble a bit and say, all right, we need a user interface because we don't have one. So luckily we, we found uh, uh, Dataverse, um, I wanna get it right, it's not just Harvard's Dataverse, it's the Dataverse Network Project, which is now a consortium of, of many um, uh, schools. But uh, we found that this uh, platform worked very well. Um, we were also able to hire a systems administrator who had worked with Dataverse before, so he, he helped us a lot in implementing it. So we now uh, are able to host our own instance of it at the library. And uh, as I mentioned, the Data Conservancy is uh, eventually going to be building some a APIs initially to, um, I think, work with Dataverse, among others, to be able to, to handle these uh, more of the preservation back, uh, uh, aspects of, the, of the, um, using the, the, the database. So um, I think many of you are familiar with Dataverse. I won't go into how it works too deeply unless there's questions later. Um, basically, it fit the model that we were looking for where um, uh, data, data sets would be organized around uh, projects, which is a, a Dataverse, and composed of studies, which would be um, individual collections that consist of any number of data items. So um, this is an example of a, a project and the number of collections that might go with it. Um, we found that um, Dataverse had uh, great you know, metadata support. Um, it had format, formatted data citations. Um, it had you know, support for, for DOIs. We, we mint our own DOIs through uh, um, EasyID. Um, and uh, it allowed a good way of not just um, doing um, 
data as a simple attachment like a spreadsheet, but actually um, doing some curation around organizing the data in a way that's useful for the researcher and meaningful to download things. So in this case, we, we were able, this, this uh, uh, paper, it made sense to organize the, the data around um, figures for the paper. Um, and uh, it also allows uh, addition of um, more descriptive metadata at the file level. To, so um, even before we chose Dataverse, we had been working on our policies for how to run the archive. Um, we wanted to do archiving that accepted data from all disciplines and formats. Um, we, we have uh, both, we have schools of arts and sciences, uh, engineering, and, and also a big school of medicine. So we, we really can be getting data from all over the place. We wanted to make the data all publicly accessible. Um, users do not have to log in to get to download the data. It's, it's open access. Um, we do uh, allow for uh, data embargoes uh, uh, by um, restricting data downloads. Um, the users can see what data is there, but until the researcher is ready to release it, they would have to contact the researcher to get the data. Um, and we currently don't su support any restricted data. Um, Nothing with human subjects identifiers. Um, that that infrastructure it, it isn't really in Dataverse. I've really only seen it done well at uh, ICPSR, the Social Science Database. So it will be a while before we can really figure out how to do that well. Um, but I think this this these policies uh, fit well the where the funders are going um, and. Uh, And as far as how we manage the archiving, um, Dataverse does uh, support self-deposit by researchers, but we decided not to do that. We uh, are, the consultants manage the whole process of receiving data from the researchers and doing the, um, the metadata data entry. Um, what this does is it uh, gives us a little bit more control on uh, curating and, and, and uh, organizing the data I think if you've seen some of these free sites like Figshare, you'll just see lots of um, poorly documented, poorly organized files that go up there. So we, we wanted to be able to provide researchers with um, a nicer looking interface, even though many of them are kind of looking at these free services. Um, we, we want to give the sense of value added. Um, so the consultants do provide um, researchers guidance on how to prepare data for archiving. And um, as I mentioned before, our archiving is fee-based. So a um, little more of the story on, on our decision to charge a fee. It wasn't our decision. It was the deans of the schools who funded us said uh, they were not ready to provide um, free archiving to all the researchers. One thing, uh, no one really had any idea of how much it costs or what, would, what kind of work was involved. Um, and. Uh, also, it's, it, it, it made sense to add a degree of, of sustainability. It wasn't meant to be um, uh, you know, covering all costs, but some initial cost recovery, which will gradually grow over the year. And it also provides sort of a barrier of entry, just, just in, in comparison to things like Figshare, where the free services um, is really, uh, we want to have research actually think about it and maybe um, have some commitment to uh, preparing data for archiving before it goes into our archive. So one challenging part though was what fee to charge. Um, and that was also in negotiation somewhat with, our, with the, with the um, schools that funded us uh, because we really didn't have any practical experience to know what it costs. Um, so what we did was started with one that had some pluses and minuses uh, we decided to, um, the, the initial assumptions were that we would be uh, working with researchers, mostly doing NSF data, data management plans where they were more or less required to share data so that most of the data sets we were expecting was, okay, the, the, the data four-year grant project will need to be archived. It's going to be, you know, untold amounts. Um, and the funding will just come from a grant. So we figured 2% um, total direct costs on the grant. 
Um, and the, what that supports is uh, two terabytes of, of storage. Um, and consultants are available to provide uh, support throughout the project, um, not just at the time that the data is um, uh, deposited, but where we offer you know, any, any uh, consultation we can do during the project, ideally at early on in the project, to be able to talk about what data they'll be eventually archiving, what kind of metadata would make sense to start um, uh, working on right away, file naming conventions, any, any kind of tips that we might offer. Um, and uh, we, d we do a bit of this. We, with our archiving clients, we, we haven't had as much call as we thought, but um, we, do, we do try to provide that extra support. And then um, the, uh, the, it will be um, uh, available online for a period of, of five years, and that uh, after five years, they can, the researcher can choose to uh, renew, um, and it will mostly at that point the cost will be close to the cost of storage, whatever that is five years from now, which will always varies quite a lot. So um, that was a, a model that worked well for some, um, uh, not for all. There was a sweet spot for, for some grants, but where someone had a very large uh, $2 million grant, but just a little bit of data to, to share, that was not a, a good investment for them. And we also had some, some cases where little tiny grants were ending up with lots of data and lots of work on our part. So um, what we did, this, ooh, this slide didn't come out at all. Okay, um, well, one of the things we did was we, we had three pilot projects early on and then a couple of initial collections that gave us a, a chance to really assess um, how much time, especially consultant time, and, and also storage costs might be involved in, in uh, hosting a, a single collection on our archive. So we um, did an evaluation. There were sort of other things on this pie chart, but uh, we, we figured out that from the time we received data to the time that it's online uh, was taking about 30 hours. Uh, and that was early on where we really hadn't had our systems quite, quite uh, uh, sorted out. So uh, ideally it will take less than 30 hours, but 30 hours is a good benchmark. So that let us, um, that helped us come up with an alternate, alternative uh, model, which we're calling the small data collections model. And uh, that is a, a fee of $1,600 um, that can come from a grant or wherever they get the money. It's fine. And then uh, it has a more limited data size of 20 gigabytes. Um, the consultants mainly su provide support uh, uh, at the time that they are about to deposit data. Um, and then it's the same terms of five-year five renewable storage. Um, so uh, the two models are, uh, we're, we're having a slow start, but, but right now we have about 37 active and pending projects. Um, we have uh, 13 collections online uh, currently. Um, one thing we're doing next year is the, the library is funding an open access data fund, which will provide funding for uh, about 18 of these um, small data collections. So that, I think, will help spur the interest and in, in the content in our archive. So um, how's, our, how's our time? Okay. <laughs> I think we have uh, time to go a little more in depth into the service workflow because um, uh, in addition to the challenge of actually coming up with a, uh, an archive, it, it was, um, there was a lot of work involved in figuring out how to actually come up with a, a support service. So I thought I'd go through the steps that we have now for um, the process of uh, getting an agreement to, to, our, to uh, deposit with our archive and then the steps to go through to the time when it's actually released. So um, initially we will uh, get the agreement from the researcher either at the time of the proposal, if they're working on data management plans or um, whenever the data is ready, they might uh, come to us for one of these small collections. Uh, we have the researchers sign a deposit agreement. Um, and then um, the consultants try to meet with the researchers, ideally early in the project or before the time of deposit, to go over some of the, uh, get an idea of what data they will be archiving and go over some, some tips on how to uh, save their time 
uh, preparing what we would need to have a good collection online, including the metadata. Um, and then I, I mentioned how for larger collection plants we, that might involve uh, uh, checking in with them periodically over the course of maybe four years in some cases by the time their project's ready. Uh, when they have data ready to deposit, um, ahead of the deposit, we send uh, the researchers a form in which helps them uh, provide uh, the project description and some of the meta metadata that's needed for Dataverse and also gives tips on how to organize their, their data um, so that it fits uh, the, the purposes that, that the people who will be downloading it uh, might, might be looking for. Um, we try to try to um, get them into the attitude of uh, thinking about not just particular users, but the broader users and the unknown uh, users who may find, be finding new, new uses for their data that were unanticipated. So we try to encourage as much effort to kind of broaden their description. And we, we aren't really scoped to do it all for them, nor do we really know their science. So it, it, it becomes a bit of a challenge to get them to spend time to, to uh, do this extra work, um, but uh, we, we try to make it easy for them. So um, the researchers do the file organization and preparation. Uh, they also would have to remove any identifiers themselves. Um, we are starting to um, provide some support on uh, building off of that um, uh, workshop we were doing on removing identifiers to actually give some more direct support on how to remove identifiers. Again, we can't do that for them, especially since with IRB restrictions, we have to be written in on the, on the study, but we're trying to um, make it a little easier for, for uh, preparing those data sets, which you know, having a large um, school of public health and, and medicine, um, there's gonna be a lot of data with human identifiers that they otherwise just wouldn't be able to share. Um, so, when it's time to actually transfer the data, we decided to actually go in person to uh, their office with a hard drive and get their data. Um, usually everything's under two terabytes, so it's easy to carry around that much data. Um, but, and we get the copy directly from their computer. What this allows us to do is not try to have them upload anything where things can go wrong. We wanna get a good, clean, original copy of their data. Um, one tool that has been uh, of interest uh, that did come out of the Data Conservancy recently is now in beta. They're calling the package tool. And uh, what this does is it, we, in, in the office setting, we would take it and, and aim it at the directory of files that they're gonna be archiving. It produces um, a list of what's in their files. It lets us uh, do things like choose uh, what will be named a metadata file, a collection, uh, study level data item. And it also, uh, it, we, can, uh, just, we can do things like uh, certain files that we don't want collected, we can um, cross out. And it allows some addition of metadata to uh, the, the, whole, the package as a whole and to um, some of the collection files themselves. We don't do any metadata addition at the office, but later on, we can, we can add what we, what we have um, in, in uh, Dataverse into a package of the data itself that will be the preservation copy of the package. So it's a way of having the, um, that information uh, carried with the curated uh, and, and preserved data itself. So, uh, and oops, and then uh, the packaging tool also will, oops, it keeps going. It will uh, package the data into a tar file that can be compressed and it will create an XML description file of what's in there. And it also creates um, uh, MD5 checksums that's very useful for doing file validity so that we, when we take it to our um, file our preservation system, we can run the checksum comparison and know that we have a clean copy going in. So that's, that's uh, it's in beta, uh, I think the release is, the final release is, is a few months away, but you can uh, check it out on that, on that website. Uh, the documentation's a little sparse, so it may take a little um, guesswork, but it is there. <laughs> okay, 
So the rest of the workflow, um, once we get the, the researchers' data back to our office, we, um, we put the data into our uh, transfer, uh, transfer uh, PC, uh, desktop PC, that also has like a write blocker that keeps all the mystery files that are on Windows or Mac off of their preservation file. And, uh, and it goes into our preservation server, which is currently the, the server that the library is using for all their digital collections. And then the um, consultants uh, take a copy of the original data, do some, any minor uh, reorganization of the data, um, additional uh, um, metadata or, or that, that kind of thing that the researcher might, might request or need, need to um, have discussed. And, and then we uh, do the uh, metadata, um, uh, we, we create the, uh, da the Dataverse file, add the metadata, and upload the data. Um, the reviewer re, uh, review the researcher reviews the collection before we do the final release, and then um, after the dataverse collection is released, we create uh, a package of the final augmented uh, data and using the packaging tool and put that into our preservation server. So that's maybe more detail than you wanted to hear, but that's <laughs> it, it is uh, it did take us a while to kind of figure out all those steps and document them. Um, and still, you know, a bit of a work in progress. One thing I will mention briefly, too, with our support service that we're sort of still experimenting with is um, the project management. When we have consultations, uh, training sessions, and then all these multi-step archiving processes, we were finding that just using Outlook and spreadsheets wasn't really cutting it well for keeping track of these projects. So we started um, experimenting with um, customer relation management uh, software, which is used in uh, especially sales and marketing. Um, it kind of has the concept of having uh, client projects or accounts and attaching, um, attaching uh, contacts to projects, having events, uh, that will um, let you do things like a workflow of the archiving steps um, from making the, making the meetings to um, getting the data and, and marking where you are in the processing steps. So the concepts worked very well. Um, I, I was the one who, I have a, a background building FileMaker databases and I've worked with CRM uh, uh, template in the past and thought it'd be a great idea to just adapt it to our, our uh, service here. Um, I would suggest that you not do this. Even if you have an expert on your staff, which I am not, I did not have the development time to really get all of this worked out and get it to do everything that we need. So what I suggest is that you check out some of the uh, existing platforms and see if they can be uh, modified to your needs. Um, one I did look at fairly extensively was uh, Microsoft Dynamics CRM. Um, and our, our, uh, most of the university licenses make it quite affordable. Um, and it seemed quite adaptable. So if all this fails, we might go to that in the future. But so far, the, the concept has worked well. We've been able to get a little bit beyond the spreadsheet in, in doing our project management. Okay. Um, so where are we heading now? Um, we're entering our fourth year. Again, we're at least in our adolescence, if not a full maturity of, of a very new area for all of us in the library world. Um, we're becoming better integrated in the university. Um, the, we're constantly finding new needs, um, new areas where we could develop more services. Um, we're, we're certainly staying very busy. Um, we're finding that this, uh, oh, we're, we're, we're hiring a fourth consultant um, this July, um, ideally someone with um, kind of a health sciences background because we, we are doing a lot of business now with, with public health and school of medicine, so having that expertise would help. And uh, we're actually uh, replacing right away our, our third consultant who, who just left to raise her babies for a couple of years. So we're doing lots of hiring. If anyone's, you know, on the market, let me know. Um, so, and, and one of the, I think, it is good advice for, for other services to, to look for these multiple avenues for where you can provide support. Um, 
even if you know we were all hoping for the uh, I think the OSTP uh, data sharing policies to be more of a kickstart for where things like uh, requests for help with data management plans have been um, um, drifting off a bit uh, we could uh, uh, we're at the point now where even if our archiving went away there'd still be a need for us at the campus so um, it's good to kind of look at all the different ways you can provide service when you do have the luxury of having uh, uh, a devoted department or a person, ideally more than one person, to do this kind of work. Okay.